this is a real treat. Um, uh, Governor Ritter uh, clearly gained uh, a well-deserved reputation uh, as someone who is at the cutting edge of energy, environmental, economic development policy during his tenure. And I think our report probably <laughs> you know, shows you some of the fruits of the labor uh, in terms of Colorado and Denver metropolis uh, with you know, very clear traction you know, as we transition. Um, the other reason, obviously, that we invited him here today, uh, he's now at Colorado State um, running a sort of new center around the energy economy. And so um, successful former governor, now basically in this space of economy and energy and environment, perfect sort of combination. I thought what I would do um, is start with the retrospective and then do the current and the perspective, but allow you to describe what you got done in Colorado, both from a substantive perspective, so we can situate you know, what's the role and uh, responsibility of the states, but then this political question. Because you're in a town where no one thinks anything will ever get done again <laughs> um, of an affirmative nature, right? So how did you get it done? Well, I'm going to start by saying this morning's panels were excellent. I'm a little confused coming out of it because I've long said that Colorado has the second most aggressive renewable energy <laughs> standard. I'm just now not sure who we're second to. Is it California or yeah, is it yeah, yeah. New York? But we're you're dropping fast. But by God, we're second. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so we we took this uh, we took this from campaign through four years of governing. Um, this was the center point of my administration, was developing what we tagged at the time in, in the campaign in 2006 as a new energy economy. It was based upon this premise that you could diversify your energy portfolio. If you focused on clean energy, you could address environmental issues, you could create economic development as a part of that, and you could do it protecting ratepayers along the way, that you could provide some equity. And we wound up calling these the four E's, energy, environment, economic development, and equity. Um, we know that education is a part of it, so you can add a fifth E. Um, and then over time, we just believe that policy support was one part of it. Mm -hmm. Not the only thing, but it was critical for us at the state level to provide as much policy support for the new energy economy as we could. So I signed 57 separate bills over a four-year period that in some way had uh, an impact on developing this new energy economy. I mentioned our renewable energy standard. It's, it's a really good story to tell. The voters of Colorado actually passed a renewable energy standard. They were the first voters in the country to do it at the ballot box in 2004, so it was before I was governor, but we knew there was an appetite for a renewable energy standard. We doubled that for the investor-owned utility. When, we, uh, when I became governor, I, right away in the first 100 days, uh, we did it within a 2% rate cap uh, by the time I had served uh, three years, we were going into the fourth year, uh, we looked at this and said we can go to a 30% renewable energy standard by 2020 and not change the rate cap. Uh, that was because our major investor-owned utility, XL Energy, really had a path forward to get to the 20% by as early as 2015, and they were well within the rate cap. And this is a really important part of the equity conversation to think about how you protect ratepayers in getting there. Um, so, so that was one part of the story, the renewable energy standard. And the fact that in 2004, a lot of people um, who were opposed to a renewable energy standard wound up supporting us when we had it before the legislature and were increasing it because they had seen that there was, A, the ability to do it, and second, that there was economic development attached to it. We, um, we did a variety of things around transmission, around net metering. Energy efficiency is something that's been mentioned. We looked at the financing part of this. We, in Colorado, we have a great quarter, I say the world's best quarter, for renewable energy research. Uh, the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, along with a co-laboratory that we developed of uh, the three major research 
universities. We've seen that um, attract private R&D. ConocoPhillips has decided to build its global facility for renewable and alternative research in Colorado. Siemens has a wind test site. There's a campus of solar companies that have built a research technology campus. And, and you know, there's just a variety of different ways of looking at the public and private where innovation matters, where R&D matters, but developing at the core of the ecosystem an, a research and development center was really important to it. And we tried to do everything we could to help that and to inspire that. We've got, you know, uh, a commercialization of technology transfer at our universities, a super cluster at CSU is a great example of where we use the cluster idea for, uh, it's a small community, it's Fort Collins, but it's an enormous um, advantage to this university, which is thinking about all the ways that we can transfer technology out of it. Now, what we saw as a result of that, and I, we developed a climate action plan that was actually tied to our, our uh, energy plan because we believed as we diversified the portfolio and decreased the amount of, of, of carbon-based resources that we could look at emissions and, and actually set goals that were achievable goals. And then uh, we said, you know, there'd be economic development. And this is crucial for, I think, the report that you mm -hmm. published today from Brookings to show the number of jobs, job creation, job growth. We experienced that in Colorado in a pretty significant way. If you look at the private sector through the recession, right, the worst recession since the Great Depression, the one place where we grew jobs was in clean tech and clean energy. There are some great stories to tell. Vestas, the world's largest turbine manufacturer, uh, they um, are a Danish company, but they were looking somewhere in North America to site their manufacturing, and it was their first plant. They decided on Colorado, and they decided on Colorado not because of economic incentives that we put on the table, but because we had a policy embrace for clean energy. They cited their first there. They've now built an additional three plants. Three of the four are operational. The fourth is about to open. 2,500 jobs will ultimately be what comes because of one company, but then their suppliers, so there's a multiplier effect to having um, a wind manufacturer there because their suppliers have moved to Colorado, and then indirect jobs that are created because of the direct jobs, and, and that's just one company. And we, get, we have great examples. SMA Solar, they manufacture inverters in Germany, and they decided to manufacture outside of Germany for the first time, and they chose Denver, Colorado as the place to manufacture. Again, not that we're, in particularly in a downturn, able to lure companies there by putting a lot of cash on the barrel head. What we did was say we're really serious about policy support for clean energy industry. So let me ask you this question because I, I find it interesting talking about Siemens, talking about Vestas. I mean, you're really talking about some of the best in class international firms, right? Um, so this morning the conversation was about exports and how the U.S. thinks about the clean economy as part of an export-oriented strategy. What you're describing is the ability to, to attract in foreign direct investment, whether it's equity, equity, whether it's firms. And in our system, that really is the state role and the local and metro role. So how did you go about that? I mean, was that, were you building on uh, sort of a, a, a past history uh, in the governor's office or throughout state government? Or is this something where you really, uh, because of the disruptive nature of this sector, really have to develop new ties, new relationships to these foreign investors? We had a sector in place for sure already. And I think uh, what we did was try and emphasize that. And when you're a governor of a state, you want to brand that state as a place, you know, companies want to be, that people want to work, that you have you know, workforce to support that, that you have an educated population, so you have an educated workforce. And, and so you basically try and, you know, develop that brand and mark that brand. And what we think we did was um, say, listen, this isn't just a brand. This is a brand that's going to be backed by uh, policies. And th those policies will provide to the extent you can as a state, both market certainty and regulatory certainty. There's been a lot of conversation up here this morning about certainty, appropriately so, right. because it's the most significant thing that investors have to consider. There's been a lot of conversation about the role of the federal government in providing that certainty, and, and quite frankly, they're right. The federal government could do um, so much more in allowing for market certainty in the clean tech and clean energy place until they do. 
Um, states can do their part in providing certainty. And if you look at the places that have, you know, the high renewable energy standards, you can definitely see that there has been um, investment, there have been investment decisions made because of the kinds of policy embrace that you have at the state level. So I want to, so let's um, move from the retrospective to the current and the prospective. Built this incredible platform, attracted investment. Uh, it's the gift that keeps on giving because you've got the clusters and corridors across uh, private, nonprofit, et cetera. Um, Jim yeah. Rossman said today he was neurotic in the short term <laughs> and bullish for the long term. Uh, great phrase. Um, we should tweet that. <laughs> um, are you neurotic in the short term? <laughs> and this is not a personal clown. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, I. <laughs> no. You're from Colorado, so it's sort of. <laughs> so, you know, yes, uh, I think I just met with a group of folks from the private sector. We were meeting with the head of the Kansas City Federal Reserve. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Tom Honig's this fantastic guy. He's been in, uh, at the Federal Reserve for 38 years, and he asked for a group of folks from the private sector and myself to come together and discuss this. And, and there was some great pessimism on the part of people who were in the private sector. There was a reference earlier today to this foreign affairs article by David Victor and Cassia Janasek. They co-authored it. And, you know, I mean, it's pretty pessimistic, right? right. They call it the crisis in clean energy uh, finance or clean energy economy. And so there's a lot of, there are a lot of signals that are sort of providing for uncertainty to those people making investment decisions. Clearly, we, are, we have so much potential. And I think the, 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 the report, the Brookings report, outlines the kind of potential and the kinds of things that can be there in regions to support this sort of ecosystem of clean energy and clean technology. But I think we're at this place where we have to make some very serious decisions as a country. And those decisions are about certainty. And uh, Brian's description about what happens sort of uh, to those companies that get you know, upfront money because they're innovative, they've got a great idea, they've been sort of brought into the marketplace, out of the laboratory, and now they need stable investment. And stable investors, they actually, you know, back away from really innovative things that haven't been proved over time. And what they do is they return to those kinds of things that they consider, the, the, the stable investors return to investments that they know have a history that they believe is going to be there in the long time, but they actually don't uh, drive the thing we need to do most in America, which is innovate. And, and we see this in Colorado as this place where we have so much happening in the laboratories that I've described, private, public, institutional, you know, higher ed laboratories. There's so many important things happening, but it's a really hard thing to sort of untie the Gordian knot of investment or financing for those companies that, that are um, needing to get to that next place. And, and I think that's a place where there's some reason for concern and without some type of certainty. And, and again, both regulatory and market certainty, either on the finance side or the policy side, and really ideally a combination of both, um, we could be in trouble. So let me follow on with, by asking the China question, you know, because it was raised in one of the prior sessions. Um, what is our comparative advantage? I suppose you can answer this um, with the perspective that maybe we do get our act together and provide certainty. I mean, I'm, you know, this is not something that's going to happen anytime soon, let's say, next six months, next year. But you can answer it with regard to that. Or, even more dire, we drift at the national scale, and we have states that begin to do innovative things. But how, wh how do we think about the build-out of this sector, given... Um, <laughs> China's commitment to be at the vanguard. Yeah, uh, so let's take the kind of downside of this right. comparative, or maybe what I would say the comparative disadvantage. China you know, has made a real commitment to the renewable space, $780 billion commitment over a 10-year period. Um, five years ago, China had zero companies in the top five solar manufacturing in the world. Now they have four out of the top six. So you can see the sort of outcome of making a, a, a determined move along the area of renewable energy and renewable energy investment. Uh, having said that, you know, companies decide on manufacturing for a variety of things. People think we lose out to China 
because we have, they have such lower labor costs. And quite frankly, if you take just solar as an example, uh, robotics plays such an important role in that that labor is not the most significant cost. Uh, the most significant you know, uh, decision making, the, 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 two most, the two things that people or companies are deciding uh, about China in terms of manufacturing have to do with actually the cost of energy because it's pretty energy intense to be manufacturing, not so labor intense, and the second is market certainty. And so they provided with sort of their direction this market certainty. And, and you know, that's, um, if you think about, um, uh, about regional efforts, like Reggie is, is a great example. Reggie provides some, you know, limited though, but, but still some market certainty. And so, um, you know, there's a reason New Jersey has the second most installed solar in the country. I often ask people, you know, okay, California's first, who's second? And um, it's New Jersey, and there's a reason it's New Jersey, because New Jersey was dealing with Reggie, I think, as a part of it. And there's then a region that, a, a reason that you can see a variety of, of activities happening with respect to the solar industry. But if you think about wind, energy efficiency, solar, geothermal, I mean, across, those, across the spectrum, we have a lot of different advantages over China. Vestas made a decision about manufacturing America after they decided it was too expensive to transport turbines mm -hmm. to America. So luckily, mm -hmm. Colorado sort of won the Vestas competition once they got to America. But they, you know, they had a, certainly to go through China and, and analyze that first. It costs less to transport um, to transport um, solar materials and to transport panels and things like that. But I think, you know, in the last panel when they talked on, about San Diego and putting solar manufacturing there, we see that. We see it in Arizona. Uh, SunTech made a decision to manufacture in Arizona. We were in that competition. We lost out to Arizona. Why did we lose out? Because they wanted to be where the market is going to be most significant. And Arizona and Southern California has the most significant market for manufacturing panels because they're going to have the greatest installation. So in, so in some respects, what you're, and this is, I think, fundamentally a role for governors and for other executives in the political system and some of the major CEOs, there's an education role with regard to both U.S. advantages and assets and with regard to the competition we, we face because the China competition is different from, I think, what the conventional wisdom would hold it to be. Our, the, the role of manufacturing right. in the economy in general but also in the clean economy in specific is much more dramatic than I think people understand. You know, we always say at Brookings, you know, if you had a poll of the American citizenry of what we import, everyone would be able to say, you know, almost to the article of clothing, that's what we import. If you ask people, what do we manufacture and export, they would go, uh, you know, maybe we talk about Boeing, but I'm not sure we would get far beyond that. So there's this huge education role that it seems like we have to have in our system to sort of at least get us all on the same playing field as to what our potential is and what kind of competition we face. So just, uh, and, and especially in this context, it's so this is going to underscore your point. Um, the last time we had a recession um, since the millennium, housing sort of brought us out of the recession. It was a big bubble built around housing, then it burst, and we have the Great Recession. And most of the economic economists that I trust will say the thing that will bring us out of this recession will when we begin to manufacture and export again. And and so, you know, I was in this debate that was about can this lead the um, the American economy out of the downturn? I don't, I don't know if it can lead it. It has to be a part of it because right. it's a place where there will be a global demand where we actually have you know the the right level of R and D and innovation or or the ability to expand upon that. But if we become the manufacturers of the technology, then we can find this as one place where we'll lead the world and we'll be able to grow our economy in a significant way in the sector that we need to to come out of the downturn, right, in manufacturing. So this idea about manufacturing and export is, I think, critical to it. And, and also, if we don't put the right policy supports in place, we will cede that to other places in the world, including China. So let me ask one other narrative question that you may have come across in Colorado, but is clearly one of the cartoon kind of comments that we have in the national debate. If we're going to build out a clean economy, we must be talking about industrial policy, right? We're going to be picking winners and losers and so forth. 
What's never really mentioned in the debate is that we've just had the biggest industrial policy for the last 30 years, was called the real estate sector, right? yeah. <laughs> supported by any number of uh, federal direct and indirect supports. But how did you deal with that kind of sort of uh, easy critique of the, of the public sector trying to bring certainty to markets and trying to have the right incentive structure ecosystem? for the build out of this. Uh, Actually, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say it was easy right. to deal with, but here's how we dealt with it. And, and in context, you know, Colorado is also a very big extractive state. Um, we produce oil, gas, coal, gas meaning natural gas. There's a lot of concerns about this winners and losers. And we tried to say this isn't a zero sum game. You don't do you know, these things so that there's you know, less of this. And particularly, it's interesting where natural gas was concerned. And uh, the gentleman from GE earlier talked about you know, their own work on natural gas as an integrator with renewable energy. And you really can see the benefits from an emissions perspective if you are able to utilize both. Now, I think there's a lot that the industry must do to ensure that they extract in an environmentally sound way. There's debates going on throughout the country. We revised our rules. We modernized our rules in Colorado for natural gas extraction. But we said there's not winners and losers. This is about emissions. And, you know, and, and so we're not trying to pick winners. We're just trying to, uh, to produce energy in a way that's diverse, that's domestic, that's clean, and that at the end of the day, we can demonstrate will create jobs. And, and those were the core operating principles. And uh, quite frankly, at the end of the day, we, we, uh, we did a variety of things you know, on the clean energy side, the energy efficiency side, but we also did a fuel switch where we said for a gigawatt of power, we're gonna transition it from coal to natural gas because we had you know, reformed the rules. We believed we we're extracting gas in a pretty environmentally sound way and that now natural gas can play this really important part in reducing emissions. It's a job creator. And so for us, it was really about dealing with this over you know, several years as, um, as not you know, winners and losers, as not something that where we're trying to pick what's gonna be here for the next 20 years, but saying, We've got something that we have to handle, which I believe, you know, we have these serious environmental issues. And one of the real tragedies has been the politicization of climate change right. uh, and, 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 you know, how it can actually stymie the development of clean energy policy because people think, well, if you're for clean energy, that means you believe climate change is happening and, my goodness, that could, you know, give us a whole set of mandates and regulatory policy we don't want. We, we should really look at this as this economic development tool that can allow us at the same time to create jobs and address environmental concerns, serious environmental concerns, even apart from climate change. That's very helpful. Um, I feel the Twitter sphere twitching. <laughs> um, but, you know, so, but I, just for the folks in the room and for the Twitter sphere and for anyone who wants to email, um, just, just one other question because I want you to talk a little about what you're doing now at Colorado State and how you relate that work to the policy challenge we have. I mean, again, everyone's talked about it. We're in this moment of uncertainty. We're not sending any kind of coherent signals to anyone out of Washington, right? So does your work directly relate to the kind of policy choices that need to be made First at the national level, and if it doesn't happen at the national level, at the state and metro scale. So Bruce, uh, what I decided to do after leaving the governor's office was to go to Colorado State University. Um, it's this fantastic school focused in a variety of ways on sustainability, um, on, on, on issues that have to do with energy, but their relationship to food production, their relationship to water and water issues water consumption, water quality, and, and you know, the campus is thematic in how they deal with sustainability. And there's also great research happening in all this, this variety of, on, on the energy and engine side. So I, I decided to go there and, and, and start this policy institute that would basically work with state governments, with uh, local governments, and with uh, business alliances, sort of on the theory that until the federal government actually acts in a way that provides us with comprehensive energy policy um, that, that we need to do all we can utilizing state governments and local governments to promote clean energy. Now, 
So there's a variety of ways of doing that. And you know, there's, there's politics in state government and at the local level, but the point that, um, that I believe you may have made earlier today, or perhaps was made in that, in that first by Brian, that first uh, panel, the, the further away from the federal government you get, sort of regional, metro, local, the less there are politics. And so what we're trying to do is sort of inspire this dialogue on clean energy agendas from what I would call the bottom up, but certainly working in state governments. I don't think we did it all in Colorado. I don't think we're, uh, you know, that, that there, there are so many good examples of places that have done some things differently and, and done, quite frankly, some things better. But we're trying to take all of those, um, sort of that menu of options and provide them to state governments and say, you want comprehensive clean energy policy, we can help you get there. It'll take a little while, and it won't be done in a day, but we can help you get there. Very helpful. Twitter? Yeah. Um, not the sort of favor this, but. <laughs> no, I really do have a question. It's actually not from Twitter. It's one of our emailed in questions. And it's from Saul Shapiro, who's actually from Aurora, Colorado. He asks, so much of the clean economy is subsidy driven and continual buildup is used to justify continued subsidies and focus on the short term. How do we transition to a long term strategy? So um, I think most of our energy policy is subsidy driven and has been for a very, very long time in this country. And so we can't just sort of pick on the clean economy and say it's subsidy driven. How do we get away from that? Quite frankly, there is a path forward, I think, on the clean side without subsidies as you just watch what's happened uh, for the price of, of various what I would call renewable commodities, solar and wind. Um, while I was governor, I think the price of solar reduced some 40 to 50 percent installed solar. Now that's, in a four-year period, pretty dramatic. That price curve seems to continue to come down. And, and in part, that's the role of subsidies is to do what they can to inspire a new technology. And then hopefully over time, it comes down. Uh, on the wind side, there was mention earlier of the production tax credit. And you know I think it's 2.1 or 2.2 cents a kilowatt hour. Um, but, but you know we just saw a company, actually our utility, XL Energy, just offered Boulder, Colorado, 200 megawatts of wind at 3.2 cents a kilowatt hour in what's called 50% operating capacity, meaning that will be at capacity 50% of the time. That's an incredible deal for wind. And it means, if you do the math on that, that wind is at parity, right, for, for that, that place that they're offering that. It's at parity with natural gas, at parity and maybe even cheaper than coal. Now, it's still intermittent, but if you think back to the GE discussion this morning, you combine wind and, and natural gas, you still get this tremendous reduction in emissions, and you do it at a price that is very, very competitive, and you can do it, I think, over time without a subsidy. The wind producers still want the subsidy, right? They want the subsidy, but the problem with that subsidy, the problem with the production tax credit, is that it doesn't provide certainty. It comes and goes. The last time we put it you know, back in play was at the bailout that happened before the election under President Bush, right before the election of 2008. It's going to expire in 2012. And so wind producers actually back off of that, not because they necessarily think they can't survive without it. They just don't want to plan something and then have that subsidy come back, and they don't get to take advantage of it. Right. Looks like a poor investment decision. And so what we need to do is figure out, are we going to do it long term or are we going to do it without it? Because either way, you would get investment decisions that are not based upon sort of the whimsical nature of a tax credit that comes and goes every couple of years. The investment tax credit has been very helpful to solar. The cash grants that were provided sort of at the end as part of the Recovery Act that you could do in lieu of the production tax credit, that's been helpful. But quite frankly, the single biggest thing that we could do as a country that would provide regulatory and market certainty at the same time would be to put a price on carbon. And, and, and apart from doing that, I think, you know, we'll use tax laws to kind of right. watch things come and go. But as you do that, you'll see investment decisions come and go as well. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. Um, questions, comments, criticisms? It's Brookings. Everyone, you know. I'm a former governor. Free, free criticisms. <laughs> Hi, my name is Sarah Smith. I'm a reporter with Platts. Um, I have a very report-specific question. It's about the inclusion of public mass transit as part of the clean energy economy. I feel that there would be probably some people that would find that as sort of a broad categorization of clean energy. And I was wondering if you could elaborate on the decision to include that and 
kind of the thought process behind it. Yeah, I think I'm going to turn to Mark, or, or Mark wants to, you know, because there was a lot of back and forth over this, and so let's let the researchers yeah, respond. That, that decision, I think, is ex exactly the kind of work we need to do to, to try to make visible uh, what this economy is. And it, that is very much based on, you know, overall carbon impacts of an activity. And we try to take a broad uh, look here, and we're trying to also anticipate uh, uh, both or we're trying to build on prerequisite uh, re uh, precedents in European analysis, but also that are informing the Bureau of Labor Statistics' his own uh, thinking. So we're trying to, th this is an emerging, you know, I think consensus decision that on balance in our transportation system, transit is uh, a carbon uh, uh, efficient uh, uh, activity. So that's, that's, that's the thinking there. And how big is that? sector. I mean. It's a substantial, you know, piece of the clean economy. And if you disagree, feel free to leave that uh, out. Uh, one of the, I think, virtues of the way we approach this is we, you know, uh, uh, built up a clean economy out of 39 smaller segments. So that allows different, uh, you know, states, different metro areas, different audiences to, to assemble the clean economy that they see. I think most people will look to our you know, set of clean tech uh, uh, subsidies, which is, a, again, a portion of this larger uh, mm -hmm. group of segments. So I think it also reflects what communities across America are looking at. You know, we did a study of, of sort of our transportation system in Colorado. And, uh, not only had we grown significantly as a population over a 20-year period, 25-year period, we'd also began driving more miles per person. So you have this, you know, multiplier effect on, on how you're using the transportation system. And um, what you're seeing is communities deciding how to develop based upon transportation. So you have, you know, transportation-oriented development as a way of thinking about this and a way really of thinking about how you reduce your carbon footprint as a community developer. Other questions? Right, right back there. Yeah. Andre Pettigrew with the uh, Climate Prosperity Project. Governor, former Coloradan, by the way. Andre. Um, there was a question earlier about uh, the fact that states and local governments are going to have less resources in order to push this clean economy. Can't expect much from the federal. What would you say are some of the strongest leverage points, knowing that the dollars won't necessarily be there and that you have to be creative? What, are, what would you say, as a governor, are some of the key leverage points that communities should be looking towards? Well, I, I really do think that there are a variety of policy supports you can put in place that actually don't have um, a fiscal impact on state government. Now, you, you, somewhere, you know, for something like a renewable energy standard, uh, people look at this and say, well, somebody's going to pay at the end of the day. That's why it was so important to me to emphasize rate caps as a part of that. Uh, we've seen communities and states actually uh, look at feed-in tariffs. And, you know, if you're going to look at a feed-in tariff, I think the European lesson is that you have to look at how you protect rate payers in the course of that, or how you protect taxpayers for that. And, and so uh, there's just a, a lot of things you could do. We did net metering. So net metering is something that's been done around the country, but Colorado hadn't gone there. Net metering winds up having a positive impact on rate payers and, you know, utilities and rural electric associations. They're going to have to figure out sort of how to do that. And it might have some fiscal impact on them, but at the end of the day, um, that can be very helpful for consumers who desire to do things around generating clean energy uh, themselves. And, and so if you, if you go through it, I mean, there's just uh, so many different ways. There was a discussion this morning about how do we finance that. And this question from the back of the room about property taxes versus sales taxes. Well, there, we had this great system, and we're not the only ones, right? It was uh, a lot of places in the country, PACE financing, right, where you could increase your property tax assessment voluntarily the county or the region looks at that increase in taxes. They bond against that future income. And with the bond money, then they pay for the price of upfront, um, upfront construction of renewable systems for residences or businesses. This was something that was taken off in a pretty significant way in Colorado when uh, uh, Freddie, uh, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac said, well, we don't want to be second to that kind of a, a voluntary uh, increase in your property tax assessment. And they really shut down pace financing. 
that's a, a place where the United States Congress could go back and say to them, you know what, we are going to allow that to happen. We're going to allow that to happen because it inspires clean energy investment at the residential or the industrial level, and that's a really important policy choice for us. And, and so, again, you can do that without an impact, right, to state or local government, and it really has a, a measurable impact on the demand level for folks who otherwise not, may not be able to afford a renewable system. Excellent. There was a question right over here, and then... Hi, my name is Dave Karpinski with uh, Nortec, Northeast Ohio region. I'd like you to comment on the, um, there's a lot of discussion about the subsidies for fossil fuels and the subsidies for renewables and kind of what, what's your take on how much of a factor is that really in the, in the takeoff of renewables and how much should we be, I guess, considering that? You know, when you think about the dollar value of the subsidy in the fossil fuel industry, it's a small percentage of the industry where the, the dollar value in the renewables is a higher percentage, but just kind of want your, your take on how we should think about that. Well, first of all, I think that, again, the dollar values are, are um, coming down. And, and, and really, um, if you look at price curves, it's important to understand the place that a subsidy can play in inspiring innovation. But then, you know, over time, how that role may have to shift to either no subsidies or something that is an, a level playing field. I have people in the renewable and, the, and in the energy efficiency industries all the time say, listen, uh, okay, forget subsidies, but let's just have an even playing field. Remove them all together. And, you know, there was a time when Congress was debating a thing called the independent drilling costs. It's a tax credit that natural gas producers or oil producers, for instance, they receive. And the industry said, you know, basically we're going to have a very difficult time surviving without it. There was great volatility at the time in the natural gas uh, markets. And so I supported keeping the independent drilling costs because our natural gas producers had seen the price of their commodity go from $13 of, uh, MCF to $2. And, and, you know, I mean, that's huge volatility, right? And so now it's at this stable pricing point. And I think um, what we have to do is, is decide are we going to have some subsidies or not and what role it plays, again, in doing the thing we need to do most, most which is creating jobs and diversifying our energy portfolio. And until you have sort of broad tax reform, that's why I hit on, on, on carbon pricing. Because there is, it's, it's very difficult, right, to go about, set about tax reform. We haven't really done it since the early 1980s in America. We've added a lot of things to it, taken some away. But if you're going to do it in a broad-based way, it would take a couple of years, even a few years, uh, to even get started on it. And, and what you could do to provide certainty that we don't get from, from tax subsidies right now, what you could do is price carbon. And it would be a market and a regulatory certainty added to the mix that is superior to all else. Let me ask you this question, because I think governors clearly have to manage the partisan politics, but you also have to manage in ways that Washington doesn't quite often, the spatial politics. So you've got a major global city in Denver, frankly, a, global, uh, a major global metropolis. You've got smaller metros. You've got uh, a non-metropolitan area, particularly around your extractive industries. How did that play out? Um, as you began to develop sort of this robust platform. What, was there ge geographical differences that um, made it more difficult to move policies? Or was there a sense that everyone had a particular role to play in the economy build out so that there was more consensus and collaboration? I'd say that it was, again, difficult. I just, I, will, I won't... Uh tell you that any of this was easy. Uh, there was some geographical dis, uh, difference, uh, certainly at the beginning of my administration, because there was a sense that developing a clean energy economy was going to benefit you know, those who could mm. manufacture renewables or produce renewables, and that it was going to be hard on the extractive industries, um, oil and gas industries, particularly in those places that were in, in the state where they were heavily invested in the extractive industries were very suspect. And so we had to manage that, and, and I wouldn't say we managed it perfectly um, or managed it well on some occasions, but we got to that place. We got to that place over time of being able to say, this is, you know, you'll hear people say this all the time, it's about all of the above, right? And for us, all of the above included certainly natural gas. It included um, renewables. It included energy efficiency. And we just kept having to say that again and again and again, but, but people didn't believe us. I mean, there's, there's so much in governing that involves dealing with people who believe life is a zero-sum game, that if there are winners, there have to be losers. And you see this 
uh, I would say the more intense the level of lobbying, the more intense the uh, sort of the zero sum feeling is. Right. And that's why we were saying, you know, you get down to the, the regional and metro areas, the, one of the biggest supporters of us and our economic development agenda, including our clean energy agenda, was the Metro Denver Chamber of Commerce. The guy that runs the Economic Development Corporation, Tom Clark, he's a brilliant guy and he got it, right? And so you hear you know, this debate at the federal level about the Chamber of Commerce being for or against this. It, it wasn't played out at the, at the metro level because our Denver Chamber of Commerce, the Metro Chamber of Commerce, they saw the job creation potential and then they saw the reality of that and so they you know, they don't politicize this issue, right? It's not about Republicans or Democrats for them. This is for them about job creation. And, and so managing that space was about, you know, developing a, a broad sense that there are not winners and losers. There don't necessarily have to be winners and losers as long as everybody's sort of in the same place on creating a clean energy economy. Yeah, I love the name of that firm in Philadelphia, Real Win-Win. And I thought, you know, maybe we could use it as a political brand. Um, what's the time, Jack? Oh, okay. <laughs> Not great. Um, I could sit here for uh, days, I think. But um, let, let, me, let me sort of end on this note. Um, I was, you know, it gets back to this question about answering some of the research questions because I was really heartened by the results of this report uh, because I had no priors frankly, as to what the clean economy writ large really would look like, right? And, but the fact that it turns out to be so export-oriented, manufacturing intensive, and opportunity rich uh, is completely supportive of a different growth model for the country. And I, particularly this manufacturing piece, because I think for too long in the United States, we've associated innovation, and I'm sure you've had this problem in Colorado, with only the high end. Right? You've got to have a doctorate in X, Y, or Z, where manufacturing enables people coming out of, still coming out of high schools, skill providers, community colleges, with an access to the good life. This, this is a really powerful, I think, result. I think what you've reminded us today, again, is the genius of our political system. Irrespective of what happens in this town, we still have the potential to build out this economy state by state and metro by metro. Um, it's going to take a hell of a lot of hard work. Uh, I want to invite you back here. I would love to get about six governors, three Republicans, three Democrats, uh, and business leaders back here to Brookings, maybe at the turn of next year, to really have this conversation. If Washington won't lead, what can the states do to basically drive this economy forward? Um, you would be a, a phenomenal voice in that. Because again, Thanks. there's nothing like uh, success of, as having done it. So thank you for coming to Brookings. Thank you. Um, thank you all. Thank you. Okay.